Welcome to The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. Today's episode is brought to you by Amazon.com. If you bookmark the Amazon link in the description box, every time that you shop, you support the show. On today's show, I will be discussing the GOP debate. I'll give you my opinion on who the winner was, and it's not a GOP candidate. It's Bernie Sanders. Oh, I just spoiled it, but it's Bernie Sanders. Uh, I'll get to Bernie Sanders and uh, his reaction to the GOP debate as well, because I think it's great. I'll also be discussing the cost of Bernie Sanders' policies, because there's a lot of misinformation going around right now, thanks to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's going to be a great show. I hope you guys stay tuned and really enjoy it. The second GOP debate took place just last night, and I will now give you a rundown of my opinion and who I think came out looking the best. So now, first and foremost, when it comes to Rand Paul, I think that as a left-wing political viewer, uh, I agreed most with him. Now, it's a shame that he's only polling at uh, about 1% currently uh, because his views on foreign policy are actually reasonable. Now, when it comes to the flat tax, he's completely wrong, and that's very misleading because what it is, in actuality, is a giveaway way to the rich. So I don't like that idea, but when he talks about foreign policy and how the Iraq war was a blunder and how uh, we should not invade Syria, how we should not overthrow Bashar al-Assad, well, I think that he's 100% right. Now, when it comes to Mike Huckabee, I think he was a non-entity. He espoused more theocratic rhetoric to no one's surprise, and I don't really think that's going to do very much to galvanize the Republican base. Sure, your theocratic evangelical Christian supporters are going to love everything that you say. Your support for Kim Davis and how she's a hero, they're inspired by that, buddy, but that's only a fraction of the electorate. The Republican electorate, that is. So you're going to have to try harder. Uh, when it comes to Ted Cruz, also a non-entity. Can't stand the guy. He's completely smarmy. Uh, everything that he says, it just, he has that pretentious shit-eating look on his face uh, to where he's just trying so hard to be a politician, but it, it just, it just doesn't sit well with me. He did not, he didn't come off well. And I think that uh, in the debate, much like Mike Huckabee, he was also a non-entity. Uh, now, when it comes to Marco Rubio, he did demonstrate some foreign policy knowledge, but the fact of the matter is that he just has bad ideas. Uh, so I think he's probably uh, going to be somewhere in the middle as to uh, winners and losers. He didn't necessarily win, but he certainly didn't lose. Uh, when it comes to Donald Trump, very interesting. Uh, he actually seemed more apathetic this time. Uh, in comparison with the first debate, but he still managed to shut down Jeb Bush because when uh, Donald Trump said, excuse me, uh, to Jeb Bush, uh, Jeb Bush, he paused for a second and he had to work up the courage to say no. And uh, that was, you know, that was a good moment for Jeb Bush's fans until Donald Trump shit on him and was like, oh, I see you've brought more energy this time. I like it. Oh, <laughs> that did not look good for Jeb Bush in the end. So I think that Donald Trump really has a way of getting to Jeb Bush, and I really like watching that. Uh, however, I don't think that Donald Trump won this debate, nor do I think he came out looking good at all, especially when it got to the anti-vax part. Uh, his lack of knowledge on foreign policy is also an issue. And in these two areas, I don't think he came out good at all. I think it may actually be detrimental to his numbers. We might see a small decrease, which is my prediction. Now, I haven't seen the uh, polling results yet. I'm probably entirely wrong because I cannot predict what the Republican primary base is going to do. No idea. Uh, but when it comes to anti-vaxxers, that's a very fringy uh, portion of the electorate that you are trying to pander to. Now, when he talks about uh, how he's going to have such great people to advise him uh, to make up for his lack of knowledge when it comes to foreign policy, I don't think that he came out well. And he actually admitted that, yeah, I'll be learning these things if I'm president. Ugh, that did not that did not make him look good. Now, when it comes to Jeb Bush, uh, certainly I think it's the case that he did up the ante when it comes to energy this time. But I don't think he's saying anything uh, that will necessarily excite voters. He tried to say that lobbyists aren't going to influence his campaign. But if you look at how much money he's raised now, over $110 million, you can see that out of all of those candidates, all 11 on stage, we know that he will probably be the most corrupt and listen the most to what lobbyists and defense contractors have to say. And you can hear that in his rhetoric because he wants war. So it's absolutely absurd for him to try to purport the claim that he's not going to listen to lobbyists because he is the typical corrupt politician. There was a portion where Donald Trump was kind, kind of uh, throwing uh, George Bush under the bus and it was great uh 
But Jeb Bush said, well, say what you will about my brother, but he kept us safe. That was the facepalm moment of the night. Now, I don't know if you guys recall this event called 9-11, but that actually happened under the watch of George W. Bush. Uh, other events, such as the anthrax scare and whatnot, such as uh, destabilization of Iraq and chaos in the Middle East, this all perpetuated more Islamic extremism, and as a result, has made uh, states within the region unsafe, has made uh, the U.S. more unsafe. So that is the most ridiculous claim of the night, I'm calling it. Uh, so Scott Walker, he really didn't do anything to stand out. His I'm a governor in a blue state speech, uh, well, the thunder from that was stolen by Chris Christie, who also is a governor in a blue state. And I think Chris Christie did a better job of telling the story how he's fought with a liberal legislator uh, to pass things through. So I don't think Scott Walker really did much. I think he's also kind of middle of the road. He didn't necessarily lose, but he didn't do anything to up his position in the race. Uh, when it comes to John Kasich, he is certainly one of the most reasonable candidates. Uh, I thought that what he said uh, for a Republican wasn't too scary, but then we got to the portion where he said he wanted to defund Planned Parenthood. You can't. You can't do that. You've got to understand. You've got to look at the facts. Only 3% of what Planned Parenthood does uh, is tailored to abortion. Everything else is women's health. So when you say you want to defund Planned Parenthood, you're not making yourself look like a moderate. You're actually hurting yourself. Now, I did like, however, when he talked about how he wouldn't necessarily just shred the Iran deal like Ted Cruz said he would do uh, when he gets in office. He said that he would actually try to work with our European allies. And Rand Paul said the same thing, that he would see if they will be uh, compliant with the deal, which is reasonable, even if you disagree with it, which you shouldn't because it stops Iran from getting a nuke. But if you at least say, look, let's see what happens, I think that's way more reasonable. Now, Chris Christie seemed more relaxed and less constipated this time. Uh, he did get destroyed by Rand Paul once again, this time on medical marijuana. In the last debate, uh, Rand Paul crushed him when it came to NSA spying, and all that Chris Christie did was appeal to emotions. Didn't do very much uh, to further his point. And this time, Rand Paul came with the facts and kind of threw the fact in Chris Christie's face that, look, you want to enforce the federal law when it comes to marijuana, guess what's going to happen? You're going to put parents in jail who need to have medical marijuana for their children who have 500 seizures a day. And Chris Christie did not come out looking good at, uh, when it comes to that. And the libertarian wing of the Republican primary base is not going to be happy with Chris Christie. So I don't think he did very well. When it comes to Bed Carson, he had the opportunity to really show up Donald Trump on vaccines, but he didn't. We had two doctors out of all 11 candidates, two medical doctors. None of them really wanted to challenge Donald Trump when it came to vaccines, which you could have you could have easily one-upped him right there. I don't know why he didn't do that. Now, of course, in typical Ben Carson fashion, he just looked completely lethargic like he was about to go to sleep. Uh, and maybe I think he's just pulling well because he's an outsider, because he's not saying anything in particular that's interesting that I think would galvanize the Republican base. Uh, now, when it comes to Carly Fiorina, in my opinion... She is the winner. She came out looking very, very strong. She was charismatic. She acted presidential. She was decisive. Uh, she had a specific plan uh, when it comes to the military. And I think that Republican voters are going to like that because she demonstrated knowledge. Uh, she knows about the geopolitics in the Middle East, East Asia, Europe. Uh, and I think that she looked the best. Now, when you actually listen to the substance of what she's saying, well, her rhetoric is terrifying because, in essence, she wants World War III or at least to uh, initiate the Cold War again with Russia. Because when you talk about putting troops on the border of Russia and Baltic states, that's not something that's going to be conducive to international peace and stability. But overall, I think that... Um, she had a specific plan, she demonstrated strength, and she really looked the strongest out of all the candidates. I think she's going to come out looking great, but again, I don't know. It's so difficult to get into the minds of Republican primary voters. So we'll see if what she said actually resonated with them, because I think she looks the best. So overall, the takeaway is that it's the same Republican themes from most of the candidates, uh, maybe not Rand Paul. Uh, they want you to be very, very afraid. They want you to uh, know that what's happening in the world is terrifying. America is now weak. Our military is shit, even though we have the largest military in the world. They want voters to be completely afraid. Uh, they want voters to think that Obama has done a terrible job, even though he shrunk the deficit by two thirds. And we've had over 50 months of consecutive job growth in the private sector, thanks to the policies of Barack Obama. Yet, they want you to think that Obama has made this 
country a lot less safe. They want to fearmonger and appeal to that frightened little Republican who's sitting there thinking, oh, God, everybody just wants to gang up on America. Well, guess what? What you need to do if you really want to win, not just the primary, but the national election is say something different. Stop with the typical Republican talking points. Actually say what you can do for the American people. Bernie Sanders reacted to the GOP debate on CNN. Take a look. Senator Sanders, who represents Vermont, of course, known as an independent, joins us now. And there he is, the man with his own hashtag, (laughs) feel the burn. Senator Sanders, you're tweeting you say you got bored, you fell asleep. What were you doing online last night, sir? It was really painful. I, I have to say this to you, Chris. I couldn't go on the full three hours. I gave up after two and a half. Uh, look, uh, their view, it, it goes without saying that my views are different than theirs, but what was really remarkable is the degree to which they avoided the major issues facing the American people and believe that every single problem facing humanity is all attributed to Barack Obama. He has caused all of the problems. We seem to have forgotten that when Bush left office, 800,000 people were losing their jobs every single month. The world's financial system was on the verge of collapse, and our deficit was a record-breaking $1.4 trillion. Senator, let me uh, give people a taste of some of the Twitter storm that you were stirring up last (laughs) night. Here's one on immigration. You wrote, Anyone on stage, maybe, just maybe, think we might want to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship? Anyone? I'm sensing sarcasm, (laughs) Senator. Yes, it was sarcastic. But here's the point. If you listen to the debate, you would not know that most of the people in our country, not all, but most of the people, in fact, do believe that we need comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. That's the majority opinion. And yet there was virtually no Republican on that stage who agreed with that. I also found it remarkable that some of the really important issues facing our country, uh, for income and wealth inequality, not discussed at all. The fact that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth, not discussed at all. The fact that the scientific community is virtually unanimous in telling us climate change is real. It is a real threat to this planet. These guys have nothing to say on that issue. Here's the other side, Senator. They were saying things. You just didn't like what they were saying. I'll go in reverse order. On climate change, they said, yeah, okay, it's there, but it's not for the federal government. Let the states deal with it more. Federal government doesn't have an answer. In terms of poverty and income, they blame you. They say you've taxed (laughs) people into a position that they're in, and you've locked up business. And most notably on immigration, they say that's on you, too, because your uh, party president, I know you're an independent, but caucusing with the Democrats, and they say that uh, Barack Obama promised it. It's part of why he got elected, and he's done nothing. You didn't get it done. These are all your problems. Oh, well, let's let's just deal with that. First of all, they do not believe. I mean, let's be frank. They do not believe in comprehensive immigration reform. And that's why the House of Representatives have not taken up the comprehensive immigration reform passed by uh, the Democrats with in a bipartisan way, I should say, uh, in the Senate. We did it Uh, in terms of climate change. No, Chris, I did not hear anybody say, oh, this is a planetary crisis. We have got to do something. Really, the federal government should not do something? No scientist that I know believes that. What they think is if we don't act now, the bad situation will become much worse uh, in late years. In terms of childhood poverty, I didn't hear a word about the need to address the fact that 40 percent of African-American kids in this country are living in poverty. Nor did I hear a word, by the way, about racial justice uh, in this country. Now, Bernie Sanders also live tweeted his responses to the answers of Republican candidates in real time. So I'll read those off to you now. 30 million Americans have no health insurance. Even more are underinsured. And Trump wants to get rid of Obamacare? Really? Now we're really getting to the Republican talking points. More money for war and confrontation. Gee, how come these guys are not talking about the great success of Bush's foreign policy and the war in Iraq? Still waiting. Will they ever talk about climate change as a foreign policy issue or talk about it at all? <laughs> Can these guys talk about anything other than their desire to go to war? They can't. That's I'm not kidding. If you didn't watch it, that's what it was about. War, war, war. When do we get to their other majority priority? Tax breaks for billionaires. Damn, they are feeling the burn right there. 
Kasich, you don't know anybody who doesn't think we should defund Planned Parenthood, really? You apparently don't know the American people. Does anybody on that stage believe the women of this country have the right to control their own bodies? Anyone? Trump, I will take care of women, really? What about respecting the right of women to control their own bodies? Waiting, waiting, waiting. Will we ever hear anything about racial justice, income inequality, or making college affordable? Rich get richer, everyone else gets poorer, and all these guys can talk about is war and defunding Planned Parenthood. Anyone on stage, maybe just maybe, think we might want to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship? Anyone? The vast majority understand we need to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. Is there any Republican who agrees? Will they discuss? Just Ben Carson. <laughs> Jobs, let's talk George W. Bush and trickle-down economics. When he left office, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. Nobody wants to mention that. At a time of great inequality, there isn't one Republican on stage who doesn't think we should give a huge tax breaks to millionaires. Uh, Rand Paul, wrong. We've lost millions of jobs because of our disastrous trade policies. The American people overwhelmingly want to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. Too bad the Republicans don't. Have you heard anyone use the word poverty yet? 47.7 million Americans are living in poverty. No discussion. Okay, let's vote for Reagan. Sounds better than any of these guys. <laughs> that's, that's major shade right there. Uh, Jeb Bush, yes. Let's continue the great ideas that got us into Iraq. Fine idea. <laughs> I, I love the tone of these. Uh, yep, Bush was a great president. Yes, no doubt. Great president. All Obama's fault. That was kind of the underlying theme of the debate, which is why he addressed it. Uh, just what we need. More neocon policies to continue the Bush legacy. Yes, Chris Christie, uh, George W. Bush gave us the Iraq War, the Wall Street crash, was one of our great presidents, you are right. Dang, the sarcasm there is awesome. Uh, what about the disastrous Supreme Court decision on Citizens United allowing billionaires to fund Jeb Bush and the others? <laughs> Does anyone know when will this debate finally end? Hashtag debate with Bernie. And he checked out about 30 minutes early because it just went on forever and ever and they were just not saying anything of real substance. Uh, all they wanted to talk about was war. They didn't want to address the real issues such as climate change, money and politics, and the shrinking middle class and community quality and whatever, you name it. They just want war. That's all they want. So now the reason why I think Bernie Sanders is popular is because he says what we are all thinking. All 11 of the GOP candidates just aren't in touch with the American people, so they'll talk about ramping up military spending. Uh, they want to uh, ramp up operations in Syria, Iraq, possibly Iran, if what they if they get what they want anyways because they want to shred the Iran deal. Now also, Carly Fiorina wants to perform military exercises in Baltic states. Yeah, because uh, reinitiating the Cold War will be a great idea for international peace and stability, right? So now what's lacking is uh, the American people in this whole debate. Uh, what are they going to do to address the serious issues? Nothing. They're not serious. They just want to fearmonger and get us so scared that we have to vote for them because they're the only ones strong enough to protect us. Um, so really... All these issues, climate change, uh, income inequality, uh, money in politics, will all be exacerbated if a Republican is elected. Uh, now, the conclusion is that none of the 11 candidates won the GOP debate. Bernie is the one who actually won. Now, I say this because Bernie Sanders gained 45,000 followers during the debate, while the best Republican only gained 26,000. So, the takeaway is that America is feeling the burn. A new article from the Wall Street Journal is titled Price Tag of Bernie Sanders Proposals is 18 trillion and the subtitle is Democratic Presidential Candidates Agenda Would Greatly Expand Government. Now in that article they state Sanders backs at least 18 trillion in new spending over a decade according to a tally by the Wall Street Journal, a sum that alarms conservatives and gives even many Democrats pause. Now before I address that claim, let's just take into account the absurdity that, uh, never mind the fact that uh, the GOP candidates, uh, with the exception of Donald Trump, all want to give more tax breaks to billionaires, and never mind the fact that they want to shred the nuclear deal uh, with Iran on day one, presumably so that way they can invade the country, which is not going to cost nothing, and never mind the fact that they are all pledging to increase military spending when 57% of our total discretionary spending already goes to the military industrial complex. But since Bernie Sanders actually wants to do something to help the people, well, now we want to talk about the price tag of someone's policies. Well, all right, let's do that. So they are correct that the price tag of Bernie Sanders' policies will be $18 trillion, about that uh, much. But what they forgot to mention to you guys is just one inconvenient little fact. The real cost to us 
will be, wait for it, zero dollars. And that, believe it or not, is just the conservative estimate. According to US Uncut, a top economist says that Bernie's policies will actually save us five trillion dollars. Now, how in the hell is this possible? Well, unlike Republicans, Bernie Sanders is not going to put these policies on our credit card. He actually has a plan to pay for all of his policies. So I'll give you some examples. He will save $32 trillion by ending regressive health care. We will save $3.5 trillion by easing stock market volatility. Uh, if we close corporate loopholes, that will save us $900 billion. Uh, by restoring the estate tax for our top 0.3%, that's going to give us $319 billion. Uh, if we end polluter welfare then that will give us $135 billion. Now, what he's talking about there is ending subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So don't believe the misleading headlines about Bernie Sanders. The fact is that every policy he's proposed is supplemented by a method to fund it. Case in point, he wants college tuition to be free, and he plans to fund that by doing a transaction tax on Wall Street. It's very, very simple. If we reallocate subsidies and funds for things that are just unnecessary or absurd, then we can actually pay for these policies. So the fear-mongering that Bernie will spend, 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 and turn us into the next Greece is completely unfounded. Now, I'm going to blow all of their minds at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is uh, kindergarten economics. If you invest in the middle class, hear me out, if you invest in the middle class and the lower class and you increase their purchasing power, what will happen is, wait for it, I'm going to blow your minds, the economy will improve for everyone <laughs> because it's not so crazy that if poor people have more money, well, they're going to spend it on things and stimulate the economy. But if you do trickle down economics and all of the wealth is centered in the hands of one tenth of one percent, well, they have so much money they can never spend it. So they're just going to keep it in their bank accounts. But when you free up that money and you tax them, then you help the aggregate economy. It's so simple. I don't get how anyone could be against it. So the real question Wall Street Journal should be asking is how the Republicans plan to pay for their policies because they want more tax cuts for the rich. They want to fund more wars that are completely unnecessary, but they won't do that because that would require them to be real journalists. And of course, as we all know, the Wall Street Journal works for Wall Street. So they don't want this dude who's going to come in here and shake up the status quo and actually, uh, Put some regulations on Wall Street that we desperately need. But when it comes down to it, I am not even mad. I hope that these attacks keep coming because they've got nothing on Bernie Sanders. They're grasping for straws here and they're being intentionally misleading and they're trying to fear monger about Bernie Sanders' policies. They're trying to use boogeyman words such as socialism. But guess what? The American people are finally starting to wake up. And that just tells me that all of these attacks means that they are scared and they should be. Hillary Clinton was recently interviewed by Ellen DeGeneres on The Ellen Show, and in that interview, Ellen made an assertion that was so insane that it almost made my head pop off my body or just explode entirely. So uh, I can't show you the video, unfortunately, due to copyright issues, but I will read you uh, the said uh, quote in question. So she says... If I look at all the other candidates, someone who is for rights across the board, equal rights for women, equal rights for every ethnicity, equal rights for everyone, the only person I can look at is you. And Hillary's response was, thank you. <laughs> of course, Hillary Clinton is going to not correct her and be like, no, we actually have uh, other candidates in the field that are pro-equality. Of course, she's going to roll with it. That's completely rational for her to do it. But she's like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm the only candidate that's for equality. Yep, mm -hmm. we'll say that. <laughs> now, um, the problem with Ellen's assertion is that there's just one small elephant in the room. And that elephant's name is Bernie Sanders. <laughs> so Hillary Clinton, of course, is not the only candidate that is for equal rights. Now, if we go back in time, you'll see that uh, when it comes to gay rights, Hillary Clinton did not actually support marriage equality until 2012. Uh, she has not released a comprehensive plan to combat institutional racism. Uh, and when it comes to fighting income inequality and helping the socioeconomically disadvantaged, she refuses to support even a $15 minimum wage, which is not even a living wage in states uh, such as Hawaii, in states like New York, which is crazy. 
but she doesn't support that. Now, she also implied that she would give more tax breaks to the rich to incentivize them to treat workers better. Yes, because trickle-down economics has always been so successful. So now, turning to Bernie Sanders, he is a longtime civil rights activist and supporter of equality for everyone. He marched with Martin Luther King Jr. He led a civil rights sit-in at the University of Chicago in the 60s and was arrested. He indirectly endorsed marriage equality back in the 80s when he was mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Uh, he declared Gay Pride Day and spoke out against homophobia in the 80s, also when he was a mayor. Uh, and he also called for equal rights for the LGBT community. Now, his voting record also shows that he stood up for the disadvantage uh, consistently as a senator. And this doesn't just refer to gay rights. It refers to uh, the marginalized when it comes to ethnicity and also for the socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, now, he's always been an activist for women's rights. Hillary is not the only uh, activist in that regard. And if you look at some articles, well, some journalists are saying that he's actually better when it comes to women's rights if you look at his voting record. Now, when you look at his current policy proposal, he has released the most comprehensive criminal justice reform plan of any candidate in the 2016 race. And he also has a comprehensive plan to help the poor and the middle class. So the fact that Ellen DeGeneres, a gay woman, couldn't even do a quick five-minute Google search on which candidate would most benefit her own community, that is just completely egregious. Now look, I'm gay, and my community has got to wake up. I see a lot of celebrities such as Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Mo Modern Family all jumping behind Hillary Clinton. Uh, but if you're going to still be a one-issue voter when we have all these problems in the country, uh, then at least take the time to do a five-minute Google search and see which candidate is actually better on the issue that is most important to you. Now, I'm going to play a clip to everyone. Now, I want individuals within my community, the LGBT community, to actually think carefully about this. Does this sound like a person that you want? to fight for your rights. Because this clip is from 11 years ago and she didn't actually change her mind until two years ago. So take a look. I believe that marriage is not just a bond, but a sacred bond between a man and a woman. I have had occasion in my life to defend marriage, to stand up for marriage, to believe in the hard work and challenge of marriage. So I take umbrage at anyone who might suggest that those of us who worry about amending the Constitution are less committed to the sanctity of marriage or to the fundamental bedrock principle that it exists between a man and a woman going back into the mists of history as one of the founding foundational institutions of history and humanity and civilization, and that its primary principal role during those millennia has been the raising and socializing of children for the society into which they are to become adults. So uh, the conclusion is pretty clear. Hillary Clinton may be in favor of equality now, but when it comes down to me, someone who I want to fight for my rights, for the disadvantage, who is for equality, well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to vote for the candidate who's been on the right side of history all along, and that candidate is Bernie Sanders. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who many have hailed as the Bernie Sanders of the UK, once seen as a long shot politician uh, who had no chance has officially just become the new leader of the UK's Labour Party by a landslide victory. Uh, now, the Labour Party, uh, which is the UK's center-left party, much like the Democrats, couldn't get their act together. But Jeremy Corbyn is going to change that. So now, for all of my American viewers, Jeremy Corbyn is akin to Bernie Sanders in that a lot of his ideas are right in line with the citizens of the UK. Jeremy Corbyn wants to renationalize the railways, well, 60% of the public agrees. 56% of the public wants a 75% tax rate on incomes over £1 million. Well, so does Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn opposes the renewal of Britain's nuclear system. So does 64% of the citizens in the UK. He wants to enforce rent controls on landlords. 59% of the public also agree and support that idea. He wants a mandatory living wage. Well, so does 60% of citizens in the UK. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn also wants to reduce the cost of tuition. 
and a plurality at 49% of citizens support this as well. Corbyn is against the Iraq war, and so is a plurality of citizens in the UK, 43%. He's also against bombing Syria, and that is also the case when it comes to uh, citizens of the UK at 60% support. Now, I'm sharing this story because, uh, one, I have a ton of viewers from the UK, so I know that they'd uh, appreciate seeing Jeremy Corbyn on there. Uh, and two, because I think that this story uh, really speaks to the fact that uh, the underdogs can and do often win. Uh, Bernie Sanders is the underdog, and I still am placing my money on Bernie Sanders as the winner of the Democratic uh, nomination. And I also think he's probably going to win uh, the presidency as well. Nobody thought that Jeremy Corbyn would go on to become the new leader of the Labour Party. Even Tony Blair was talking smack about him and uh, basically implied that he could never win. A lot of people said that he couldn't win, but look it. So this gives us hope in the U.S. that Bernie Sanders can uh, do the same thing that Jeremy Corbyn has done, and that's win and fight for the people. Well, that's our show. I want to thank all of my subscribers, and I also want to welcome all of my new subscribers to the channel. I will see you guys next week. We will be discussing more interesting issues, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Take care.